Cameras? You don't need a camera. You don't need it. Okay. Is there only? I don't know. I don't know a thing. Don't ask me anything. Come on, do you think this microphone is working? The microphone in the room is working? No? No. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, but then again, we've got a unique speaker. <laughs> First, I want to thank you for coming in at the 11th hour. We've been looking up for you know, so she came in and then decided to help out, you know. Um, uh, she's a professor in Nelson. She's been ahead of the partner right here in 2014. And uh, she is also a professor of uh, at my engineering department. And uh, she's been the head of uh, studies. I think if you have a lot of people here doing savings uh, courses, you realize that uh, it's been very good. The one as well. Yeah, they're not listening anyway, but thank you. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, 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 yeah. So we're going to get a unique presentation from her today as we present to you, Professor Priscilla Pinel, and Desmond. Let's put our hands together. Yeah. That's good. All right. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, but I think it'll be interesting, so stay tuned. Um. The title I've given this is Subsurface Space as an Earth Resource. I think we in mining tend to think about mining minerals, but underground space is a space resource as well. And we have to be a steward of that, even as we are steward of mining material. I love this. Um, so we can think about the world trends. We've all heard a lot about this. Um, this is a plot of quality of life versus power consumption. And this is uh, each data point converts to different countries. So you can take an exception to what is quality of life, although there are several metrics out there. You can have a choice for them. The UN has uh, established a metric for quality of life. But it's pretty clear on this uh, log plot on the bottom, it's a similar plot log on the x axis. Um, power consumption corresponds correlates pretty well with quality of life. So as quality of life increases, you would expect the power draw, the power demand to increase. Oh, is this weirdness? Okay. I have no idea why it's doing this, but for urban life, which is happening increasingly in the global extent, here we can look at uh, the power kilowatt per person around the world, different countries, and we can see some pretty amazing things. Things have been increasing high schooling, low infant mortality, high life expectancy, and in particular, water and power, they asymptote 100%. And what that effectively is meaning 100 years ago, people did not have the human right for access to water. That was not a human right. Access to power was not a human right. It is now. It's becoming a human right. So everyone is going to expect all of these things as a, a human right expectation. And we can look at what we've been doing for this power system that we're dealing with right now. We can look at the four and a half, four point six five, or whatever billion years life of the Earth, and you see that first started getting any bioactivity somewhere around three billion years, and then the atmosphere turned oxygen, and eventually. Plants came around and started depositing coal. And we had a lot of coal to be pulled out. We also started geologically making oil and natural gas. 
It all depends upon how deep and what the pressure temperature is. That's what it is, physical chemistry for the most part. But you look at what has happened in the last 10,000 years, effectively, we had a blip of 400,000 years of sol stored solar energy from the time that plants first started. 400 bil million years of solar energy has been consumed in less than 400 years. That's what's been happening, right? So we look towards the future, power has to go up, or we have to figure out how to use things, make things work more efficiently so that the power draw can go down. But inevitably, the quality of life is expected to go up globally. And that's what we're facing, you're facing. So we have some tsunamis dealing with infrastructure because infrastructure is a, a big word that I use for all of those things, those services that people expect to have, right? We have climate change, we have energy transition, we have circular economy and mine waste. Do you know anything about mine waste? We have critical minerals. We have concrete and greenhouse gases, which is, uh, we are placing on the order of five tons per year per person globally of concrete. And almost none of it is recycled. Something to think about for the future. Aging population, which we certainly have. I'm among them. And we have increasing issues of equity, sustainability, ESG, and resilience. So if a four storms happen in the future, storms are very big, wipe out a city, the city comes back fast. Right? That's resilience. So we also know, because we're mining people, that needed for net zero, there's all sorts of data out there and, and uh, uh, expectations been decided. But for copper, for example, the, what we need is the equivalent of one escondida per year discovered and into production every year in order to supply that copper. Right? Not going to happen, right? Um, nickel and lithium, 40 times increase we need in nickel and lithium. And with the time of being 20 to 30 years from discovery to full, full production, we got a problem, and it's compounded because we have increasing environmental social restrictions that may stop the project. So this talk is thinking about taking this kind of constraint, ESG, and put it over onto the infrastructure. So we're not talking about money here. We're talking about how are we going to provide that city-based, highly urban environment for the people of the future globally so that everybody can have it. So drivers. Global population and our cities are growing in the United States. We're up about 80% of everybody in the US lives in the city. Globally, it's over 65%. And it's only going to increase. People want access, they go to the cities. Um, the location and condition of infrastructure is largely unknown. You go into uh, most of the cities in, in the United States, pull up the streets and try to figure out where the pipes are, and you're surprised always. We don't know where they are. And by and large, we don't know their condition very well. But they are old. You can see down here, the average age of New York City water means and sewers is 68 years. Nominally, civils would say 50 year life, maybe 100 year life. But a third of the systems are well over 100 years old. You don't know where they are, and we don't know where they're going to break. Right? Problem. Um, we've got problems where every time we have a major event, major uh, storm, like Superstorm Sandy. Things happen between the infrastructures that we hadn't anticipated. So we could have a big flood that wipes out the underground and it takes out all of the generators, the backup generators, and we can't pump the water anymore and boom, it cascades, right? And we didn't know that. Our systems aren't designed for that kind of thing. And so we say, oh, it's an act of God. Well, no, it's an act of engineering and we have to do better in the future. Um, so I assert the following two things about this um, underground urbanism when you start thinking about it like this. I assert that the effective and integrated use of underground space in the world um, is vital in the world of the future. We have to think about how to use underground space, not just let a project go out really nearly one by one, Think about it as a system of systems, and we have to think about that. 
And the use of underground resources can contribute to both sustainability and resilience if we design them. Right? But we're not doing that right now. So we have things that we need to do. So the main topics I want to talk about is a little bit about ESG, um, a little bit about donuts, a little bit about system of systems, um, chronic issues for underground space, trying to identify the research needs that we have to go out after in the next five to 10 years. Final closing comments on ESG and then I'll, ESG and I'll try to summarize, right? So you all know where we're going. Okay, ESG. I think everyone in this room knows ESG. I gave this talk or something like it about a week ago in a room that was filled with civil engineers who had never heard of ESG. Right, don't hear it. So environmental, how does infra an infrastructure owner act as an environmental steward? That's the key. S, how does an infrastructure owner engage and serve its employees and its stakeholders? How does it do that? And governance, how does the infrastructure owner make policy and communicate decisions? Right? That's what ESG has turned into um, infrastructure. And ESG is becoming more and more important. And we have to do the work to make sure that placing infrastructure in the underground is duly considered in the planning by these cities, which it's not right now. Okay, so what does ESG imply for infrastructure? Well, you can look around on the web and uh, you'll find QII, the Quality Infrastructure Investment Principles. This is put out by uh, PRI, has some very similar listing of it, but this is by the G20. Um, so these are countries, big countries, talking about infrastructure. And they say all of this, maximizing the positive impact of infrastructure to achieve sustainable growth and development. That's a charge that must happen. Raising the economic efficiency and thinking about life cycle cost. Integrating environmental considerations in all infrastructure decisions. Building resilience against national natural disasters. Integrating social considerations and infrastructure investment and strengthening infrastructure governance. Same thing with ESG. And this was put out in 2019. I bet you maybe 5% of the civil engineers have ever looked at this. It's not on, it's not on their agenda. So as countries pursue infrastructure investments, they have to think about ESG. And civil engineering has to wake up to this. Uh, because they're going to have to do all the documentation that's required by ESG to show that you're doing this. So, what does ESG imply for infrastructure and financing? Well, the role of infrastructure is at, to act as a catalyst for sustainable growth. You have infrastructure so you can have an economic engine, so that people can make money, so that people can raise kids, so that they can have access to the things that they want. And increasingly, now it's the low carbon economy that drives this as well. Um, the gap between infrastructure needs and infrastructure investment is estimated to be on the order of 15 trillion globally, and that's probably an underestimate. Big money. Um, this gap cannot be reconciled by public financing. So right now in the United States, most infrastructure projects, roads, sewers, water, fiber optic, whatever it is, most of that, um, it comes through public funds, but the public funds are not adequate. So you're going to find more and more projects that serve the public done by private entities. And the private entities are the ones that are going to have to go and borrow the money. And ESG is going to hit them hard because the people who have the money want ESG. So that's what's going to be driven. All right, so it's becoming more important. And so engineers must do the work to ensure that it's thought about well. Now this offers some opportunities as well. Um, it should make governments on behalf of the people um, encourage innovation. Right now, the civil engineering world is fairly conservative. It's not really open to innovation, but this is gonna drive innovation, right? As, as we do this. Uh, uh, all these capital projects will provide opportunities to support innovation, and we're going to have to have new skills for the engineers. 
They're going to have to know more about AI, big data, all sorts of things that they're not learning right now in their undergraduate degree program. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, the shift and the procurement of uh, infrastructure away from the government to direct tax, away from taxpayer forms of investment to alternative contracts like build, um, operate, uh, transfer kinds of things where someone will take a con some company will take a contract and agree to build a super highway system. They will charge tolls and they will recover what they spent from the tolls, right? So they're operating it as well. Now, someone in that kind of a situation, they really are much more on top of uh, maintenance, of keeping the system running because that's where the money's coming from. And they're very interested in that. It's not like using public funds, putting it out there and saying, there it is. Um, we'll try to do something about it. So we're gonna find alliancing uh, public private partnerships, new ways of financing infrastructure are gonna drive a whole lot more accountability. <clears throat> so in this context, I wanna introduce you to the concept of donuts. Has anybody ever read this book? All right, I suggest you read this book, All right? This is done by Kate Regler, who's an economist. And her thing in the future says, look, no, I can get back. I can't get back. She says in the future, or in the past, we've had what she called a tyranny of economists. These are the, the social scientists that get Nobel Prizes, right? Nobody else does. So they're hot stuff. They think they're really good. And they really established this world of, you judge your country and how you're doing on your gross national product. It's economy tells that whole story. And what she said was, no, not in the future. You cannot do that anymore because we have to think about economic growth, but we also have to think about social growth and environmental growth. All those ESG things have to be in there too. Because none of us can get it without any. So she looked and made the world look like a donut. I don't know, I'm pushing the same button and it decides which way it's gonna go. So she came up with this concept of a donut. We live in the dough, that's where we live. The hole that's in the middle of the donut represents the boundary of human rights, fundamental things that people should have. This is human needs. And we exist as a society to stop people from falling into the hole. You fall into the hole, you don't have access to anything. You don't get to vote, you have no rights. So stop people from falling into the hole. The outside boundary is the planetary boundary. Do not infringe upon the planetary systems like the atmosphere, like water, like CO2, like all of these things out there. Don't do that. Live in the dough. And the dough is not growing. So we have to think about how to live in a dough that is fairly constrained, right? And still feel like we are succeeding and growing as people. May not do it economically, may do it otherwise. Some people have talked about the center hole as being the infrastructure desert. There is no service for the people who fall into the hole. So uh, here's an example of um, uh, this kind of thinking. So the planetary boundary, we're concerned about air pollution. Ozone, climate change, ocean acidification, freshwater withdrawals, all of this information, that's the planetary boundary. We should not be impacting the planetary boundary, particularly if we do not understand the system, which we do not in the atmosphere with CO2. We don't really, really know. The inside is the social foundation, and it really deals a lot with equity issues, equity of access. And you note that, the richest 1% of the people in the world own half of the world's wealth. That is not equities, right? So we're not sharing wealth very well. All right, the donut and infrastructure has been drawn like this as well. Here's people stuck in the hole. The city goes around in the donut, all the different things that you'd like to see in a city. And the outside area is uh, the planetary boundary. This can scale, it can be a global donut, it could be a donut around your town, it could be a donut around your house, it could be a donut around a mine, right? 
Anything can be a donut with a scale similarly so appropriately. And you can look at Amsterdam's. They used the donut economic model to completely revamp their policies and operating procedures. Their number one statement was, we are going to have um, the donut economy rule. We're going to make our policies so no one falls into the hole. Everyone has access to everything, and we are not impacting on the planetary boundary. And other cities have followed them. Right? And when you do this, you have to think about what the infrastructure impact is of that kind of life. And I suggest in mining, mining companies should be thinking the same way about their mining companies, because that's where the expectation is going to be. And not to be uh, put down, the energy people have created an energy bagel with the same idea. So we have energy poverty in the middle, not enough access to energy, and on the outside, carbon decadence. We are just putting CO2 out there with that, right? Whatever we want. So you get the idea? This is a good way to think about things. Success in life and work in the dough must respect two mandates for the long term. Regenerative design. That means you don't just use something once. You think about reuse. You think about recycling. You think about design for disassembly and reconstruction. You're thinking about this all the time. And distributive design, where everyone is getting equitable access and they're getting uh, the opportunity to share in the economy, in the environment, in the social aspects, in all of this. So this affects the kind of infrastructure system that you would build. So regenerative, not degenerative. We don't have the take, make, use, lose. We take, make, we regenerate, we restore. So the question for an infrastructure can be, um, after, a, after a water line becomes too small, what do you do with it? Well, what do we do with it? We leave it in the ground and walk away from it and say bye, right? We build another one. What can we do instead of that? Can we think about ways of actually making our infrastructure regenerative so that we can reuse it? Centralized means that we share value equitably, but we recognize that the value is not only economies, it's social value and it's environmental value. And we preserve all of those values and make sure that everyone has access. So in the economic terms, we're talking about enterprise ownership, ethical supply chains, community empowerment, things like this. Changing the way governments and people and industry interact with different goals but they, they work it out. Three, infrastructure is a system of systems that all interacts, and we have to think about that. How do we understand how this complex system of systems works in a city? We have right now underground spatial chaos. This was uh, about 1920, pulling up the uh, pavement in downtown New York City by Wall Street. You can see all the pipes all over the place. Uh, we're constantly surprised by, right, there was a big steam pipe explosion in downtown Manhattan that people had even forgotten that we had a steam line, but we did. We had a steam line and it blew up, right? We don't know where things are. We have gas pipeline explosions with great regularity in the United States and I'm sure in other countries as well. So we have spatial chaos. We have this philosophy of life cycle engineering, but it's only a concept. There is a really a a rigid formalism as to what exactly we mean by life cycle engineering. And even more difficult in some places is we have a mix of public and private systems. So after 9-11 in the United States, I know many of you were not born then, but I was. And when 9-11 happened, the uh, US government created Homeland Security as a department. Homeland Security said, we've got to understand our infrastructure in the country. All of you companies and all of you cities, give us your data. And the companies all said, uh-uh, we're not sharing data. So we have this problem. We know it's a system of systems. We know that there's emerging things that we don't understand that can cause us trouble. But people don't want to share their data. Even in a city, the water people don't talk to the sewer people, don't talk to the transportation people. People think data is their something of value to them and they don't want to share it. So we have to get over that because we're never going to get to the systems that we need unless we do that. 
And we think about optimization. Now, every engineer says, I'm going to optimize this, right? Now, and those of you who are taking Mind's design, you optimize on what? I don't know, productivity, net present value, right? No more. <laughs> you can't optimize on that because you're going to optimize on resiliency. If you want to design a system that's resilient, it's not the same system that's sustainable. It's going to be a different system. And if you want to do it for lowest cost, it's going to be something else. If you're going to do it for equity, it's going to be a different system. If you're going to have environmental and you never want priorities, you'll have a different system. So how do you optimize? You don't. This is what the nature of living in the dough. We have to think about all these priorities and come up with something that represents a reasonable compromise. And then we have to think about the overriding tsunamis of energy, climate change, and of course, cost and schedule. But you choose different priorities, you end up with different systems. They're not the same. So consider New York City infrastructure in the human body. This is a, a New Yorker cover um, from 2008. So the idea that all of the systems, transportation, um, sewer, everything, in New that's Manhattan. Everybody recognize that? Manhattan, it's sort of like a human body where we've got blood systems, right? We've got circulatory systems, we've got brain systems, we have, we have breathing systems, we have skin systems, we have all the systems. Now, we have a lot of systems, but we don't know how they work together or individually, really. Someday we're going to get there. So they're both very complicated systems. We and the medical profession very often pretends that each one of our systems is separate by itself. So you have blood disease, you're only going to look at blood. But in fact, blood disease can be caused by other things in your body, right? Your body is very complicated. And the same thing is true for uh, the urban infrastructure. It's complicated. So, however, somebody in the past realized that found temperature, defined what temperature was. And it became clear that if your temperature was 37 degrees centigrade, you were healthy. What does healthy mean? Able to withstand viruses, colds, whatever is going on around you. Something about 37 degrees. Why? I don't know why. But it's a very simple measure that takes the whole body into account somehow. So I suggest that we should be looking for something equivalent to 37 degrees centigrade for a big city. So you can say, how is your temperature today? Right? Are you, are you um, uh, well? If a storm hits tomorrow, are you prepared for it? Will you fight it off? Um, so we have to think about synthesizing the systems. Now we could model each system individually, but putting them all together becomes a problem. So we have to explore the urban response to critical events. Everything like a big storm that comes in and rains like heck um, from uh, a big so surge of tide that comes in from an earthquake, from anything else. Those are all experiments that nature has run for us. And if we study it, those experiments can tell us how our system performed and how to make it perform better. Right? So we have to be very alert as engineers to deal with this. And maybe then we can find the metrics and the methods that will allow us to model and to understand our cities as systems of systems that all interact. All right, we have other issues that uh, bear on this. In the United States, land is on fee simple. What that means is, if you have an acre of land on the surface of the earth, you own the land straight through to the center of the earth, right? Not true in every country. In China, it's not true, right? It varies from country to country. But we have a problem. In uh, the United States, it is fee simple. That means that if you go to New York, almost all the subways run north-south because that's where the city streets are. And the city owns the streets. You can't optimize where you're taking people in your transportation system because you don't own the land. So I think that what we need to do in the United States and other countries is figure out how to uh, change that sense of ownership the way China, uh, Tokyo did. After the uh, Kyoto earthquake um, in 1995, they passed the 2001 Deep Underground Utilization Law. 
And they have the same fee simple that we have in the United States for ownership. But by doing this, they said, you get the top 40 meters to do your foundations or to do a parking garage or whatever else you want. Below that, it's public. They changed the law. And when they did that, they started being able to put things in a, um, a system of systems sense of rebuilding the infrastructure after that terrible earthquake that hit. Um, the other thing I want to raise is that we don't really have a value for underground space. Um, if you have an acre of land in Manhattan or in Denver, you know how much it costs because there's a market there. People would bid, bid on it, right? Um, but if you have a cubic meter of underground space in Manhattan, who knows what the value is? There isn't any value. So we have to figure out how to value underground space so that we can think about the trade-offs for above ground and below ground. Without a value in the underground, we can't do it, right? So if we want rational thought and design, we have to deal with it. Um, we have chronic issues for underground space. I'm a geotechnical engineer. These are things that on every single product we hit and it's like, there it is again. And it's almost always water, something with water in the underground, which causes problems. Um, but we've also got a reputation for being much more expensive than anything else. So we have to address that. We have contractual issues. Um, not everybody's on the same side of the fence on that. Um, our cities tend to plan projects year by year based on how much money they have that year. So they don't do long-term planning. Um, local connections and access, the last mile. This is uh, really an equity issue. You know that the, the city of Golden, you, you have to connect into a sewer line, you have to pay for that sewer line connection. And if it goes bad, you have to fix it. This becomes an equity issue because if you don't have that much money and suddenly your sewer fails, you have to go and take care of it. Or if you're relying on public transportation system and the bus stop is two miles away, close the student, you have to walk that two miles. Right? Whereas if you had a car, you could drive home. So the rich people don't have the problem, the poor people have the problem. Right? Problem uh, that continues. We've got systems of different ages and different materials and different performance. Some systems were put in last year. Some systems were put in 150 years ago. And we don't take care of things that well. When, you know what a lane cut is? You, know, you ever been in a city and you've seen somebody have homes up and they say you can't go in there because they're digging a hole and look at the pipe or do something in it? In New York City, the average number of cuts of the lanes, cuts of the road, 550 a day. Not coordinated. Each individual. Each individual utility goes out and cuts their own hole, but we need it. Nope, and nobody's coordinating anything. This is really dumb, but that's the way it is. So we can do something about that. Uh, material deterioration. Civil engineers are pretty good about strength of materials, but when you get into how long is that material going to last, they're not so good. Time, time rate of decay and deterioration is not very clear. And water. Huge impact on construction, huge impact on long-term ability to use the facility. We have not solved the water problem yet in underground construction. Um, we just replace, we don't repurpose. Um, we don't really have environmental and social metrics to include in planning. And we've got all sorts of geologic risks, whether they're unanticipated conditions, oh, look, who knew a fault was there, or unmanaged conditions. I knew there was a fault there, but I did, pretended that I wasn't going to hit it. So when I hit it, I didn't do anything. Right? Many different reasons. And there's, of course, policy and politics. So now we go to gaps in research that needs to be done. We need to understand what technical and analytical advances are required for the people responsible for infrastructure to do a better job. And then underground people have to provide them the tools and the information to let them make the better decisions. So we have to do that. And we have to think about the social, economic, political, and policy decisions um, that need to be changed in order to give a fair playing field so that people think about underground space as a resource. Right? So 
Um, we want to find a research framework that addresses the quality of urban life in a way that allows us to model the city and then show the city planners how if they put that facility underground, things would be better. Right? Think the city would be more resilient. We don't have that tool. We need the data and we need the tool. And we need to think about how the underground space can actually make the city more sustainable and more resilient. And explain it to politicians so that they can act differently and still get reelected, which is the political game, right? So they have to do it. If we don't have the metric and we don't have the methodology for modeling the city, we can't do this. And other one, then all we're doing is asserting, saying underground space is good. It's my favorite. I like underground space. And they say, well, that's nice, but too expensive, too much uncertainty, too many risks, not going to put it underground. They have to fight. So where are the gaps? We have data gaps. Everybody's got their own data. It's all in different forms. Model gaps. This is a plot that shows, do you see all the infrastructure? Electricity, gas, oil, water, information systems, all of these different types of infrastructure. Um, and this is how they were modeled. Some of them are modeled using agent-based system dynamics, uh, relational databases, network theory. These type modeling types don't fit together. Can't make a model of models just by plugging them together because they're very different models. So we have some fundamental work on modeling that we're going to do in a system like this. We've got knowledge gaps. We have technology equipment gaps. EMI here at, at uh, Mines is really trying to address those equipment gaps, come up with better equipment that will work. We need decision tools to help the planners. We've also got workforce and skill gaps for the future. If we start changing to more robotic operation, who's going to run the robots? Who's going to maintain them? We have governance gaps. Who gets to decide? Right? Who gets to decide? Um, financing gaps, policy gaps. So we need to do work in all of these areas in order to make it so that we're making better decisions. And we have to think about optimization because engineers like to optimize things. But you have to think, who are you, who are you optimizing for? Or what is your basis for optimization? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? Because it all is happening. So back to ESG. Our governments have been traditional drivers of social and economic performance in our cities, particularly through infrastructure. So when times get bad, what happens? In the United States, we have public works projects. Let's get people out working on public works, right? It becomes a tool for addressing social issues. But we're finding that the private sector infrastructure players are coming in. And so we have to think about all of this in the context of generating stakeholder support. We want the public to be happy with what we're producing. An example that I found interesting, George Washington University in DC, in their school of business, not in engineering school, the school of business has started a new program, ESG and infrastructure from the business standpoint side. Their vision I think is pretty neat. Our vision is the transformation of infrastructure development where sustainable infrastructure is the norm, promoting environmental leadership, social well-being, and strong governance. That's what they're in the business of doing from a business perspective. And that's going to happen more often in the future. Okay, so summary. There's two slides left. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure demands are only going to grow over time. But our population is still growing. It may top out and it may start decreasing, but who knows? But it's going to grow for the foreseeable future. The expectations of the people of the world are changing for what they want and what they want access to. Everybody wants to live like we live in the United States or better, right? So they all want things. Um, if underground space is to be appropriately considered, in responding to these demands for service, all of those gaps need to be addressed. And why should we be putting infrastructure underground? We need to make compelling cases. Um, Hong Kong has put a lot of its big infrastructure underground. 
They have no land space work. They put their sewer system underground. They put their water treatment system underground in big caverns. Um, we haven't done that much in the United States, but you could. I remember when I first got my first faculty position at the University of Texas at Austin, um, I got involved with, they were doing some tunneling work. So I, I liked tunnels, I went and worked with them. And they were trying to figure out where to put the next sewage treatment plant. And lo and behold, it turned up on the four sided town. Was there any governance about this? No. That was where the land was cheapest, and they will yell very loudly. So we'll put the sewage treatment plant there with its smells and everything else that happens. That won't happen now, and it cannot happen now and into the future. So we need to think about what needs to be underground. And why are we doing this? We're doing it because we want equity for everybody. We want to preserve the environment and we like our surface space. We want to have a lot of land where we can, you know, go for runs and ride bikes and do other things and safe, be safe, right? So there is a role for underground here. But another thing that I think we really have to have this social discussion about, social, economic, and governance discussion is what are we going to design it for? Do we want to design the system to be sustainable? That sounds good. Cool. We've had that word around all the time. Um, I don't know what the word means, but uh, sustainability generally examines future uh, options and tries to find the best uh, solution via indicators to attain your goals. So it's incremental, right, in terms of what it's trying to do. It fixes things as you go, but it's not transformative. Sustainability, you do not say, ah, do away with everything we have and start all over again. No. Resilience is a little bit different. Resilience expects there to be an emerging adaptive capacity. It's transformative. And when it sees a big storm coming in, it tests itself. All right, I'm going to lose some of the infrastructure for a short period of time, but I'm going to minimize it, and I'm going to be prepared so that when we build back, to quote Joe Biden, we build the land better. So each of these events becomes an opportunity to improve. And resilience is all about that continuous, continuous improvement. So sustainability prioritizes relatively short term outcomes. And resilience prioritizes uh, really robustness in the face of extreme events of chronic stress, speed stress that we expect climate change to bring to us. So we have to understand what those words mean. And then we have to think about how we're going to have the conversation. Um, what is going to be our basis for design of any system that we do? Because we have to think about this. The end. Thank you. Any comments or questions? He's half baked. I knew David was going to be next. Yeah, David. So, so my question is with the uh, underground space. They might get a multiple question, but I'll just start with this one. But the underground space is sort of a issue of like, well, we can't necessarily keep this up. So when it comes to like maintenance or repairing, it's going to make more difficult. But then is that addressed also by your other point of we just need to have essentially better maps of what's actually going on? Wait, well, you know, our, our, syst our systems that we have now were built one by one by one by one. They were not built as a coherent system. There are, there are people who are arguing for a piece of what, what is often referred to as utility words, where you put all of the pipes of all the systems in the same kind of the And we need to access it. And we need to access it. Fill out the last mile of the local connection. Um, but I think we have to understand um, that there is value in underground space, and there's different requirements for different systems. So most of the sewer lines that we have in the United States and everywhere are gravity suits because nobody wants to pump sewer, sewage, right? They want it to gravity flow. But others, other systems can be put wherever they need to be put. And you also have to think about the geology underground because there may be some very good quality rock at depth that large openings could be made in. And they, that space should be zoned and reserved for large space things. Um, little pipes that that, uh, that you can well, put put um, you don't need a big space for it can be put in poor quality geology. 
So you can do geological zoning in such areas and decide where you're going to put things. But we also need to make our systems smarter. Most of our systems are very dumb. They have not been instrumented, right? They're just dumb concrete. So future systems, we're getting to the point where pretty much everything comes and is installed with enough instrumentation so that we can understand how it's feeling. What is its temperature? Is it going to have a flu? I don't know. Whatever it is. But I like the human body analogy. So, yeah. Great presentation. Um, I, I think you have challenged that, and uh, this is very futuristic, thought-provoking, and uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. My understanding of the donuts uh, is also a whole different new thing to me, but my question is, how do we stay on the right side of the donut, barring the future participation of private um, yeah. funding yeah. without deviating or departing from capitalism. Yeah. I mean, I think capitalism has to do some of its own thinking because it is economically driven. By you, it's it always feels justified in making its decisions on an economic basis. And in the donut, you can't, right? So I think the cities like, like Amsterdam are, have been having those conversations, trying to figure out how they can support enterprise, innovation, new companies coming in but not infringe on the boundaries. And, and, and maybe in some cases they could grow the donut. But as of right now, the only way to grow the donut is really to know that planetary boundary much better so we know exactly where those thresholds are. Where are we gonna turn on the Middle Ages when we had snow for a hundred years? When are we gonna start the next glaciation? You know, we don't know. So as long as we don't know the answer, so someone came to me and, and wanted to talk about subsea mining and subsea disposal. And my response was, you probably know less about the deep ocean than we do about the moon or Mars. And if we don't know something about it, I don't want to go down there and start messing around with this. So we have to, we have to think of, define our donut so that everybody understands it. And then everybody have a voice to making the decisions inside the donut. And that's governance. And the private companies can be in the governance, the government can be in the governance, but the people have to be in the governance too. Yeah, one back to you, David and Bree. Yeah, a um, couple of things. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning about this concept called the recycling of concrete. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really interest to discuss about it because it's something that nobody wants to talk about. Yes, I know. Um, for many real reasons, but that's for a different uh, topic. Uh, that's a part as you fully mentioned that should be discussed more is about these laws, about uh, this public uh, ownership yeah. below a certain yeah. threshold. Um, that happens in Japan because it was after a major event, a, a catastrophic event, but that's the only reason why it happened. Honestly, for all other countries, it should be really difficult for this to happen because it interferes with the ownership of privates. Below 40 meters, you know that many countries have still some sort of infrastructure. Yeah, you know. Jakarta is shrunk because of that. Mexico DF is having the same thing. Probably Manhattan will face the same thing at some point. Well, but you look at this and you say, yeah, I, I look at this and I say, Manhattan has relatively shallow, very high quality rock. Right now, they've got just finished the third water tunnel, which is about 20 foot diameter, bringing water in from way upstate all the way down and it's connected into Brooklyn. Big, big tunnel, 600 foot depth. You have right there an opportunity for pump storage, but you need an upper reservoir. Yep. And you can't put the upper reservoir underneath the city streets because that's the reservoir. It's shit. Yeah. You know, so I mean, yes, we reclaim this. We want an upper reservoir. We're going to put it in the rock and we will be able to go off grid because we can provide our own energy for the city of New York. People aren't talking about it. I put that up there because people have to talk about it. But we, as the underground space people, have to make the tools that will actually be believed and demonstrate to the decision makers why we should consider this. That's exactly where my question lies. How can you convince these people? Uh, these lawmakers, these people from the government, to make this decision that will affect them directly. 
because these people are pretty much those millionaires and people in power that will be like affected by this. Okay. These are not short conversations, but I think that this is a part understanding about ESG. They are. And if they ever want to borrow money, they're going to run smack dab into it um, in terms of the requirements. So we have to start the conversation and find the voices that can make the case because they're not going to listen to me. Who the heck am I? But if we could get somebody big, uh, Warren Buffett, to come out and say something categorical about all of this, people would sit up and say, oh, so we need to find those people. Hopefully that happens soon. I hope so. I hope so. Okay, last question, David. So my uh, question then is, in this kind of system, I do realize this is like an aspirational, but um, it seems like this only really works in urban centers. Because, for example, I was in Soda Springs over the summer, 3,000 people. They would never want to do that kind of system. Like, no, there's a lot of space all over town. Yeah. Um, is this something where also it is, I don't want to say reliant, but it is contingent on we all live in, or not all, but like, if this is about urban centers, not about. No, and I, I think it's it's most pressing in urban centers. Okay. But but we do have the data that indicates that um, the United States will be over ninety percent urban. Now, but underground space argument here is over. So the idea that we could make compressed air energy stored in uh, drilled shafts to not great depth, have people have renewables, but you need a battery, and I don't want to go buy battery that requires cobalt, nickel, and everything else. Yeah. Sure. I don't want to, I want a geo battery. So we put that underground and we use, when we have the power, we compress the air, when we need the power, we let it go. We could have a 10 megawatt, I think a 300 foot deep drill shaft, six foot diameter, could be a 10 megawatt battery. And for a small, small town, yeah. that would do it. Yeah. So, oh. I mean, I think there are other arguments. Yes, my arguments here are mostly urban because that's the most pressing. Yeah. But the same ideas can be applied in other locations too. Okay. Thank well, thank you. you so much for all of your attention. Thanks. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.